What does the games in Beijing in 2022 mean to the Chinese Communist Party in your mind? Why are they so keen on this? Well, I, I think it's very akin to the games in Berlin in 1936. It provides an opportunity for a brutal totalitarian regime to tout itself as, um, as being something that it's not. It's a propaganda bonanza that that regime will then use to as a smokescreen for all the other atrocities that they are doing. So Beijing had good success with this in the 2008 Olympics. They made all kinds of promises in 2008 about how they're going to improve their human rights record, and they've broken all those promises to the point where now they've been officially designated as committing genocide. They will say whatever they want you to believe, all right? And it has no relationship with reality. You totally cannot trust anything that they have to say. So, you know, you organized uh, this uh, uh, rally recently uh, in front of the U.S. Capitol where a number of different, uh, you know, dissidents spoke and so forth. Now, I, I, I was there briefly and I ran into, uh, you know, let's say a very, very seasoned D.C. politician. Um, he basically echoed something that I've heard from a number of people um, uh, re in recent times. And it's just that the idea of this complete boycott it's really a tall order. Why might it be like that? Well, okay, so saying a complete boycott is a tall order means it's hard to do. Does that mean we don't do it? Oh, this is hard. We're not going to do it. Okay, or what kind of character do we have? When we say never again, do we mean never again? Or do we mean never again unless it's China? or never again unless we have an, an, an economic tie with a country, or never again unless it actually costs us something. What does it mean that we've officially designated them as committing genocide? Okay, so what, what, what constitutes this genocide? So we're talking about rampant forced abortion, forced sterilizations, systematic rape. We're talking about religious persecution, interning between one and three million people, forced labor, the execution of prisoners to harvest their organs for transplant. What does it take to say we're not going to honor this country by participating in their Olympic Games, where they're just going to be touting themselves as being a, a wonderful and great country? Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's a great question, isn't it? I mean, it's almost, it's almost hard to fathom. Um, you are not new to this whole question of human rights issues in China. I mean, I've, I've been observing your work uh, with uh, Women's Rights Without Frontiers for years. Um, and I, I just, for, for starters, you know, maybe tell me what you do, have been doing with your organization. So Women's Rights Without Frontiers is coming up on our 10th anniversary this year of existence. So we're very excited um, about that. And we started out basically as an advocacy organization because at the time, I'm, I am an advocate. I mean, I'm, I'm an attorney. I'm a, I am graduated via law school. I practiced litigation for eight years. Uh, and when I found out that women were being forcibly aborted and sterilized in China. And, and this is a long story, maybe we can get into it, but um, I m moved away from the practice of law and I founded this organization. So we, like one of the first things we did, in, this was in like 2008, 2009, at that time, people believed that the one-child policy was voluntary. And of course, China was putting out their propaganda saying it, it's voluntary. And maybe just briefly tell us what exactly what the One China Policy is. The One Child Policy. So the One Child Policy was instituted in 1980 and continued until 2016, where it became the Two Child Policy, more, more recently the Three Child Policy. And we can talk about that, but forced abortion is continuing under the Three Child Policy. So the One Child Policy was instituted because China was experiencing a population explosion and they wanted to bring down the, the um, fertility rate. And so what they did is they said, everybody can have one child. And they enforced that through incredibly brutal forced abortion up to the ninth month of pregnancy. And some of these forced abortions were so brutal that the women themselves died along with their full-term babies. 
forced sterilization, forced contraception, infanticide. And um, I had believed the Chinese propaganda that it was voluntary. Uh, so, so I knew that they had a one-child policy. I had never stopped to think how it was enforced until as an attorney, I represented a refugee who had been persecuted as a Christian and also forcibly sterilized under the one-child policy. And what I mean by that is that she was literally dragged out of her home, screaming and crying and pleading, and held down to a table and cut open and had her tubes tied without anesthesia. She said that the pain was like somebody was holding a blowtorch inside of her. And sure enough, she ended up with um, a uh, chronic migraines, chronic abdominal pain, chronic back pain from the time that that happened to the time that I represented her, which was a, a lot of years. So I think she has, she's like permanently disabled from that operation. And that's when I learned that it was, it was coercively enforced. Um, and so in my first testimony before Congress, a very, very brave man had gotten a lot of information out of China. And he, um, his wife had, been, had suffered a late-term forced abortion, and he and his wife both felt like that, that they didn't care whether they would die. They were going to get the word out about this. And that's, that's the point where people get pushed to. It's like, uh, you know, in this surveillance state where you can't really dissent, it's like they were willing to die to get the word out. So he went out and he photographed and documented forced abortions and forced sterilizations in the, in the villages around him, got it out to another human rights organization, which gave it to me, and I had this translated, and that became the basis of, of my first congressional testimony, which basically blew out of the water the Chinese narrative that this was all voluntary. Um, so, and of course, Cheng Wenchen had been doing incredibly brave work prior to that, getting the word out as well, and he was being detained and tortured and his whole family persecuted for that. So, and then Steve Mosier before that had done that in the 80s. So mine was one of the voices that, that helped bring this all out. One of the documents that he was able to get out, I call best practices infanticide. It was a, an email chain where Chinese OBGYNs were talking to each other about how best to make sure that a late term forced abortion, that the baby would be born dead and not alive. It is, it is like the most chilling document that I have ever seen. Um, so that's how we began. Then, after a number of years of, of raising the visibility of this issue and also running, a, you know, I spent several years on an international campaign to help free Chen Guanchen, I got the idea of, why can't, you know, can't we help people in China to escape forced abortion to, and also gender side, the sex selective abortion of baby girls. Um, and just by providence, I know someone who has friends in China and they are our network. And now we are like the only organization in the world where you can actually um, save baby girls in China. So that's called our Save a Girl campaign. And what we do is we have a network of field workers that finds out about women who are being pressured to abort or abandon their baby girls or also who are just so impoverished that their baby girls really are at risk. And we go to their door and we say, congratulations on your daughter. Girls are as good as boys. Um, and we will give you a monthly stipend for a year to empower you to keep your daughter. And uh, so we give them $25 a month, the equivalent in yuan, and that's enough. The money is enough for the woman to go back to her husband or her mother-in-law and say, you know, I can't abort. I can't abandon this baby girl. Look, she's a lucky girl. She's bringing money into the family. And we have saved about 300 baby girls in this way. And also girls that we've also kept families together where the mother would have to go to the city and, and leave her baby with the grandmother because they don't have enough money, just give them that amount of money so that she can stay with her baby, keeping the family together.